A couple of weeks ago, I started this new series. I'm a member of the President's new Space Force, and here's what we've seen so far. And I asked you if it was one you wanted me to continue reading, and your answer was a resounding yes. So here we are today with part two. Now, if you haven't listened to part one, this is a continuation, but it also kind of stands alone. So don't worry if you haven't. Uh, you can go back and listen to it later. Anyway, here we are with part two. So I think you know what time it is. It's time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Have you ever been inside a Colorado police station before? Here's a better question. Have you ever had to pick up your troubled brother from a Colorado police station before? If you have, you may be able to sympathize with my plight that day. I've been waiting there since one o'clock for him to be released. Our parents died about a year after I left for the army. We have very few relatives who cared about us. My parents were pretty much the black sheep of their families. So it was, of course, down to me to take care of him. It's probably for the best that it happened this way, I suppose. Being in the military, I get all sorts of benefits and on-base housing necessary to help raise him until he's an adult. Which makes one side of that equation easy. The other side, the actual parenting him side, well, I just don't know. He's 16 now, gets in fights all the time. I think he might be part of some anarchist punk gang that spray paints public property and vandalizes abandoned areas or some shit like that. I can't really keep up with it. We barely see each other. He's never home, I think. Well, I mean, I'm never home. I'd volunteered for an earlier transition into the Space Corps than the rest of my units, after being offered a lucrative bonus. I've been an E6 for three years now, and I'd say with confidence that I'm pretty good at my job. My military job, not my parenting one, that is. I suppose the military offered me that bonus for my skills in tracking objects and directing joint partners against spaceborne threats, <laughs> not my skills in guiding my brother through life and giving him a chance to feel like a happy, successful adult. I apologize for how depressing I must sound, but, well, I'm doing the best I can. And I'm starting to think the best I can do is not good enough. I feel like the more successful I am in the military, the more I fail my little brother as his guardian. The cops called me while I was at work. The newest member of my section and I were going over counter-space academics, which is the term we use for the death by PowerPoint sessions we put our people through every now and then, just to make sure they still know their job. It's ungodly boring stuff sometimes. Basic shit everyone knows out of tech school. The NCOIC for our flight was droning on about one of the first anti-satellite weapons, ASAT, tested by the United States back when women were still wearing shoulder pads. The ASM-135 Bold Orion. Basically, a converted nuclear missile with its warhead taken out and replaced with a hardened microsatellite that would detach from it once in orbit and then proceed to smash into its target like a hockey player. The Air Force was even successful in taking out one of its own failed satellites with the 135, proving it could work. However, due to the death of the Soviet Union and increasing skepticism surrounding the strategic and defensive initiative, the project was quietly cancelled. That was, until defense industry executive and weapon designer extraordinaire Frank Monterey stuck his nose in it. Mad Monterey cried foul before the ink had even dried on the cancellation orders. He then proceeded to cry foul for over a decade after that. In the 90s and early 2000s, he would even buy late-night airtime on a few of the major networks to present his case for renewed ASAT development and... He, you guessed it, even an independent space branch for the military. Today, my unit is responsible for the direction and employment of the fruits of his labor. The General Systems ASM-270 Orion's Revenge. This one is not only faster than the 135, but it has more destructive potential as well. After passing through the mesosphere and into the thermosphere, its first stage detaches allowing a second stage to engage briefly for several seconds in a wild fireball. After this initial burst of flames is over, the rotors attached at the nose unfold from the missile's remaining fuselage like a parasol. 
small angled tip jets located at the end of each rotor blade that ignite, allowing the weapon to adjust its velocity as it enters orbit. As it approaches the vicinity of its prey, the tip jets deactivate. At this point, the missile's rotors, made of a special hardened alloy, can be used to permanently damage or completely destroy whatever they impact. After a few goes, whatever rotors remain can be used to steer the ASAT to its final target using its last bit of fuel, killing the adversary space object with a kinetic blow via the tungsten encased cone that constitutes its nose. Using this method, the 270 is capable of targeting a small constellation of targets, usually three to five objects depending on size. Because of how it unfolds after launch, those in our unit have taken to calling it the Killer Umbrella. Sorry, I feel like I went off on a tangent there. We're supposed to be talking about my brother. His name is Jerry. Our mum named him that because, well, I'll be honest, I can't remember now. She told me once when I was younger, but I don't seem to have soaked it in. Let's see. I know, he skateboards. Well, I think he likes to vape, maybe. I know he listens to that genre of music on the internet. Vapor waver, something like that. That's probably why I think he vapes. This is kind of embarrassing to admit, but I'm supposed to take care of him, and I've been taking care of him for quite some time now, and yet I don't know a thing about him with any certainty. I can talk for days about this missile I've only seen pictures of in classroom, give you every little detail of its development and even the politics surrounding it, but I can't be bothered to invest a minutiae of time into figuring out who he is or the kind of young man he's developing into. I guess I shouldn't blame anyone other than myself when he gets into trouble like this. It took me about 30 minutes to leave base and arrive at the police station. I walked up to the sheriff's deputy sitting at the front desk and asked him my question. Hi there, my name is Wesley Fairbeck. I received a call telling me my little brother Jerry had been arrested. The deputy looked me up and down, dressed in my OCPs, with a new Space Corps regalia adorned upon it. He replied, Ah, yeah, the little skater asshole spat at me when they brought him his punk friends in. I scratched the back of my head and tried to save face. I'm really sorry he did that. I think he may just have a lot of adrenaline and peer pressure going through him right now. He's really not like this. Right, the deputy said as he rolled his eyes, picking up the phone at his desk. Ray, it's Diaz. Skater asshole's brother is here to pick him up. He looked back up at me, noticing the name taped on my left chest that read U.S. Space Corps. He joked to his friend over the line. Oh, scratch that. Buzz Lightyear's bottom bitch is here to pick him up. He began to chuckle as he threw the phone back down into its place, forming a shit-eating grin as he looked at me and said, Hey man, relax. I'm just having a little fun at your expense. He did spit at me after all. I kept back the urge to throw my fist through the glass that separated us. Right, I said back to him. So, I take it he's not being charged with anything. He said, That's right. One of his little friends was the one who actually assaulted someone. With a knife, no less. From what the victim told us, your brother tried to calm things down. Anyways, you can have a seat over there while my friends finish questioning him. He pointed to rows of wooden chairs behind me, arranged to face the bulky box TV that belonged to some other era of history. I furrowed my brow and said, Thanks, under my breath trying to prevent my anger at this prick from swelling out of control. I sat down in one of the front chairs and checked my phone. I saw that I'd received a text from one of my troops. Her name was Space Specialist First Class June Alvarez, and she was one of the many to be the first to attend Space Corps basic training at Lackland Air Force Base. Her text read, Sergeant, I know you had to go to the police station, but could you hurry back? The PowerPoint is over and we're back to work now, but I'm still pretty lost on some of the telemetry stuff you were showing me earlier, and no one really wants to help me at the moment. I texted her back. I'll be as fast as I can, but these cops are being assholes right now. Go get Sergeant Flores. 
I know she's studying for her level 7 test, but if you are in dire need of help right now, she shouldn't be too mad that you're interrupting her. I sat back and stared at the blurry, horribly antiquated machine in front of me as it spewed out ad after incessant ad. One featuring a beautiful, young, bikini-clad blonde sipping a soda cola with Mr. Conga Line on the beach. Introducing soda cola lime, the voiceover said. The familiar taste that America trusts with a refreshing twist. Another featuring footage taken from the Armstrong moon base, with the Eras logo in the corner. Finally centering on the company's CEO with a drink in his hand as the music from 2001 plays in the background. This time the voiceover said, Mental is now the official soft drink of Eras CEO Hood Fisher. What's yours? Get mental or get out. Finally, a less annoying one appeared after that was over, this time featuring supersonic airliners elegantly passing through clouds set to the tune of a soothing score. The voiceover asked, With a safety record and time to destination like ours, just remind us again, why wouldn't you fly Air Virginia? After that hell of hokey commercials was passed, the news returned. The commentator was grey-haired, bespectacled, and wearing a dark blue tie, signifying his well-known outspoken support for the Alliance Party. Breaking at the top of the hour, our coverage continues of the situation in the Indian Ocean, as it now appears attack boats belonging to the New Indies Construction Front have besieged a Navy hospital ship attempting to relieve wounded and dead from evacuated American and Allied forces that escaped Diego Garcia last week. He then proceeded to go into a long rant about the President and the Homeland Party, while talking over a reporter who was live from the scene. The TV signal must have become distorted somehow, because eventually I couldn't understand a word he was saying. It was as if he was mumbling. The picture on the screen blurred out even more, making the images depicted indiscernible. I began to feel weird physically, lightheaded. I'm not sure if it was the stress of the day or the fact I'd been sitting there for a while or what, but... I had this gnawing sense of danger in the pit of my chest. The room became bright, and for a second, I thought I saw some sort of indescribable shape appear out from behind the TV. All of a sudden, I heard a voice speak to me, not from any direction, but as if from all directions. You must wait to hit your target until 1935, no later. Do not let the girl with the long legs see what you are doing. I woke up out of my trance, shouting, What? As I realized nothing was behind the TV. I was in a cold sweat now. I felt as though I'd just woken up early in the morning. I looked outside. The sun was beginning to go down. How long was I out? Was I out? The program I was watching was over now. The blue-haired woman with the FPML button on her lapel was on instead. Knowing that she comes on quite a few program slots after the old guy with the dark blue tie, I inferred that I must have napped for... four hours? What the hell? I said out loud as I quickly took out my phone. It was dead. Not good, I said to myself. Just then the door to the detention area opened. I turned my head and saw Jerry. All right, we're done questioning the little punk, the deputy from before said, pushing Jerry forward into the waiting room. He was holding his favorite skateboard in his hand, gifted to him by our dad many Christmases ago, now broken in half. Jerry turned around and gave him the middle finger. Lick my ass, pig. I shouted at him. Jerry, knock that shit off. What the hell's wrong with you? He turned and saw me now becoming even angrier. Everything became silent for a moment. Finally, he spoke up and said, Can we just get the hell out of here? I'm tired of smelling pork. He looked back at the cop and gave him a scowl. I grabbed him by the shoulder. Be quiet so we can leave, moron. He flinched and brushed my hand off. I don't need your stupid-ass advice, he said angrily and walked through the doors outside to the parking lot. I followed him. As he approached my truck, I unlocked it for him so he could get inside. But before he did, 
he slammed the remnants of his board into the bed of the pickup. I yelled at him again. Could you not throw shit around like that? This is my truck. I paid for it. It's what gets you to school. He yelled at me in turn. Oh, could you shut up for once? God damn it, you're so freaking annoying. Slamming the passenger side door on me before I could say anything back. Not wanting to take this any further, I walked around to the driver's side. As I started the engine, I remembered from before that my phone was dead. I plugged into my car charger. I noticed then Jerry had a tear rolling down the side of his face. I know he must have been upset by the whole ordeal. I tried to speak to him, beginning to verbalize his name, but before I could get anything else out, my phone reactivated and alerted me with a series of text message and missed call alerts. My attention was fixated on that now, as I realized I'd missed over 30 text messages from seven different people and 18 phone calls from Alvarez, Flores and my NCOIC. I opened Alvarez's most recent message. Sergeant, where are you? The NCOIC has been trying to call you for two hours now. He needs you to get down here quick. I'm not going to say why, because OPSCC, but get down here, please. I let out one long fuck as I read that. Jerry wiped his face with his shirt and asked, What now? Without answering, I bolted the truck out of the parking space and started driving back to base, 20 or 30 miles over the speed limit. Jerry kept trying to ask me questions on the way there, realizing there was something wrong. But I refused to talk to him. I just kept dropping F-bombs over and over as I swerved in and out of potential car crashes on the way back to squadron control room. We finally got to the gate, and I hurriedly took out my CAC card and gave it to the security forces guy standing outside my truck. The airman scanned it and said, Here's two, please, pointing at Jerry. I screamed at my brother, Come on, give me a goddamn ID. He screamed back. All right. Calm down. Jesus. The airman looked calm as I had my episode. I gave him the ID to scan, and he led us on our way. Arriving at my unit's building, I cut someone in a muscle car off before they could take the space that I wanted. I left the windows rolled down, turned the engine off, and hopped out. Jerry was still inside. He shouted at me, indignant. How goddamn long are you going to be? I cringed, turning to him as I took my wallet out, removing my CAC card and security badge from it. I threw it at him and said, If you want dinner, walk down to the BX and get something from the food court. I then booked it into the building. As I ran up to the polarized bulletproof glass doors protecting the world of my profession from prying eyes outside, I saw the sign placed just before the steps, proudly displaying our squadron's battle cry below our new service's motto. The former read, We maintain the balance, with the latter exclaiming, Secure the high ground. I pulled on the door handle, rushing inside as I was met with another security forces airman who needed to check my security badge before letting me through. After being led inside, I sprinted down the hallway to the control room where my workstation was. There were five people crowded around it. The NCOIC, Alvarez, and two women in Class B uniforms who were unfamiliar to me. Their nameplates read Hayek and Hayek Song, respectively, which made me wonder if they were siblings or something. The one with a hyphenated surname was an E6 like me, which is called a color sergeant in the Space Corps. The other one was an officer, O3, a captain. They were almost twins, I thought to myself, and extremely attractive to boot. The NCOIC looked at me and yelled, Where the hell have you been? I tried to explain, exasperated. I'm sorry, sergeant. My phone died and I somehow got knocked out. He cut me off. I don't want to hear it right now. I'm frankly shocked you display this kind of behavior. We're going to have a long talk after today. I can tell you that much. Now, sit down and help Alvarez out. She needs it. 
Roger Sergeant, I said, defeated. I sat down next to Alvarez in my swivel chair as he walked up the steps to where the commander and the other higher-ups were. Sergeant Flores was at the workstation in front of us, tracking something else. I asked the space specialist, So, what the hell happened? Alvarez explained. Well, after I texted you, me and Sergeant Flores started tracking one of these Chinese space flights they've been doing for a while now. I know they're just testing, but... Well, this time they went near New America. Two of them, in fact. It was kind of like that thing they did last week when they overflew Armstrong, but not as bad as that time they almost smashed into the damaged MS-1A we were monitoring. I asked, Okay, so what happened? Did they do something belligerent? No, she said. They've just been sitting there doing some EVA. Sergeant Flores is still tracking them. I think they're about to pack up and leave right now, actually. I was confused. Okay, then, what's the problem exactly? I demanded to know. She groaned. That, pointing at the big screen in front of the entire room. Depicted on it was an amorphous object. I can't really describe it effectively, but it looked strangely familiar. It was black, resembling a cloak without a wearer, maybe. I'm not sure. I was looking directly at it, but... It was also as if I wasn't at the same time, like how things blur out in the periphery of your vision. And the this was smack dab in front of me. I asked, lost for words. What is that? She responded. Uh, after we were able to get a fix on them, Pine Gap contacted us. They wanted to know if we could check to see if there were any foreign space assets near one of our surveillance satellites that had become unresponsive. And that's when we found it. It wasn't doing anything, really. It was just sort of near it. We gathered some basic information about its position and size as it moved towards a commercial satellite in the vicinity. It stayed there for a while, but then it just darted out of view towards L5 without any warning. Um, towards the Chinese? I asked. She nodded her head. Well, what is it then? Some... PLA weapon we've never seen before? I asked again. No, I... She stuttered. I... I think they're as confused as we are. As soon as it showed up behind the construction site for the orbital settlement, they stopped doing maneuvers and started observing it. It... detached... something just before you got back, and one of them got out to capture it, we think. But whatever split off from it seems to have disappeared somehow. I don't know. This is all very strange, Sergeant. I looked up at the women with similar last names. I leaned over to whisper in Alvarez's ear. Who are these two? Um, they're from Virginia or something, she said under her breath. What? I said. I began to feel as though this was way too much for a day like today. That's what I said. I think maybe they're intel people, but I'm not sure. But the thing is, they showed up with all this data on the object. Its usual orbit trajectory, flight path history, more detailed dimensions, frequencies it operates on. Tons of stuff we would never have figured out ourselves. It's almost like they've been tracking it for years. That's when the captain interjected. Talking about us, kids? My eyes widened. Uh, no, Mom. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. I forgot my rank. She reassured me. Oh, it's quite all right, Sergeant. I know this must be a lot to take in. I don't blame you. She turned to her friend next to her and said, Constance, go chat up the commander for a bit. I think he feels left out. I have this handled over here. Uh, yes, ma'am, the color sergeant affirmed and walked off. The captain sat down in an empty chair next to me crossing her legs and planting her heels on the desk in front of us. For a second, she managed to distract me. All right, <laughs> cut me some slack. I, I'm a guy, after all. But she didn't distract me for long. Her voice broke my concentration. Specialist, we're probably going to need you guys to start making some calls to get something scrambled here pretty soon. Yes, ma'am. 
I'm sending a request out to Norad right now, Alvarez responded. Good girl, the captain complimented or belittled her. I could tell it irritated Alvarez somewhat. Sergeant, could you double check something for me? She asked. Uh, yes, ma'am, what? She went on. The commercial satellite the object interacted with earlier. Could you find out who it belongs to? Roger that, ma'am. I typed away at my keyboard, collecting the information for her. I pulled the satellite's designation up on my screen. Eras 12120, I said aloud. I cross-checked its name on the government's registry of civilian-owned space assets. Ah, uh, it says it's owned by Eras, ma'am, but it has some sort of note under its listing. Let's see. Here, it says it's a broadcast satellite operated by Eras and, and contracted out to a television provider. I lingered on those last few words. Television provider? My mind went back to what I'd seen earlier before. I wasn't sure if I should tell anyone or not. Hmm. Thank you, Sergeant, the captain said, and pulled out her government phone to begin texting someone on it. Just then, Sergeant Flores spoke, pointing at the screen in a panic. Look! The object was suddenly in front of one of the Shenlong she'd been tracking. The other Shenlong, it seemed, was running away from the situation, leaving its comrade behind. How the hell did it get there? The NCOIC said out loud. Flores, are they still doing EVA? He asked. I can't tell, Sergeant. That thing's messing up all our sensors. I can't even contact the other monitors we have nearby. Wait, look what it has. The sergeant blew up what she was referring to on the big screen. It was a tungsten rod used for construction of one of the orbital settlements. It wasn't holding it, but it was as if they were orbiting the object itself, like it was its own planet or something. The captain stood up from her seat and started to sound a bit panicked. Holy shit. Sir, it's what I said before. It's going to conduct a kinetic strike. Probably for here. The commander nodded at her and took control. All right, people. It's the fourth quarter, and this is the ten-yard line with our backs to our own end zone. Sergeant Fervick, what's going on with NORAD? Alvarez butt in before I could respond. They just got back to us, sir. There's a couple of F-15s out of Oregon that can be ready to go in 90 minutes. Not good enough. We need something in less than 60, or we aren't going to make it out of this alive, he informed her. I looked at the information Norad had supplied us with and interjected. Sir, there's a pair of aggressors out of Nellis on TDY flying back from Miramar right now. Yeah? So? He questioned me. Well, sir... They're less than ten minutes away from Edwards at the moment. We could have them land there to be fitted with the 270s Edwards still has on hand. They could be armed and back up in the air within 40 to 50, if everything goes right, I explained. He looked unsure. He gave a skeptical glance to the NCOIC. Just before he could say something back, the captain intervened. Sir, this sounds like the best option we have at the moment. If the information I briefed you on earlier is right, then I don't think we have a lot of time on our hands to play footsie with Norad all day. He looked over the room, contemplating her answer, reading all our faces. All right. All right. Call them up and get it going. No more screwing around with this thing, he said with a cautioned tone in his voice. About sixty minutes later, we were ready to go. The F-15s had taken back off from Edwards and headed towards Death Valley at supersonic speeds. An AWACS from Norwad patched in their position to us and relayed a comlink with the flight lead. I had everything at my station ready to go. Alvarez would keep tabs on the project's movements while I would guide the F-15s into position and provide them with the necessary targeting information to input into the ASM 270s brain. Captain Hayek would continue to observe and advise us from behind. I looked back at the commander for a quick second. He saw me and said, 
You got this, Sarge. Take this bastard out. I nodded to him in affirmation. I put the headset on and keyed up the comm link with the pilot. Breaker 11, this is Big Horn Control. Do you read me? Roger that, son. This is Breaker 11 and 12. We're packing heat now and ready to enter our climb, the pilot explained. That's perfect, sir. Object hasn't moved so far, and if it stays that way, we shouldn't have to waste a second shot. I brought the object up on my screen, taking note of the information Alvarez had just collected on it. All right, Breaker 11. Big Hong Control says you can initiate your climb. Please notify me when you reach Angels 30. Copy that, Bighorn. We should be there in about 15 to 20 mics, the pilot radioed back. The wait for them to get into position was shorter than expected, but grueling all the same. We were at 75 minutes now, with a gun pointed at our head. The object stayed in place, tungsten rod still circling it like a late-night mugger with a knife in hand. My chest was pounding, throat lumpy, head splitting open from all the stress of the situation. Finally, the pilot radio back in. All right, Big Horn Control. Angels 30. Awaiting orders. That's great news, Breaker 11. Pulling the target's orbital position up now. I then gave him the necessary numbers. After a small conversation between him and his wingman that I could hear through the headset, he responded again. All right, Big Horn. Breaker 12's telling me he's locked and loaded, he said. All right, sir. Hit Angels 32 and fire away, I informed him. The aircraft climbed a bit more. The sky must have been the darkest shade of blue anyone could imagine at this point, I thought to myself. The wingman screamed over the radio. Breaker 12, Fox 5. The missile detached from the centerline pilot of the aircraft, the F-15 breaking away and turning around back towards Earth as its first stage ignited. We picked the missile's location up on our side, tracking it on the big screen. At my workstation, however, I had more specific information about the weapon's speed, velocity, its ultimate target, and when its first stage would separate. I looked at the clock on my computer. 1908 hours. Again, I thought back to the events earlier that day. Something was gnawing at me again, deep in the pit of my chest. At this rate, the object would be struck before 1935. That should be good. But why do I feel like it's not? Perhaps it's the stress again, I'm sure, but... God, I can't. No, something isn't right. I can't let this continue. I can't let it happen before... Bef before 1935. I looked over my shoulder at the captain. She was acting as though she was watching the missile's flight path on the big screen like everyone else. But I knew she was taking glances at what I was doing here and there. Why? Did... She... Did she know? How could she know? I hovered my cursor over the control for the missile's first stage. I typed in what I knew to be the incorrect separation point. My ring finger glided over to the enter key and stayed there. I looked back over my shoulder again. She was locking eyes with me now. I looked past her, glazing my eyes over, as though I let something inside of me take over my actions. Sergeant? She questioned softly. I don't think anyone else could hear her. Sergeant, she said again under her breath. I pressed the enter key. The first stage detached before the correct altitude could be reached. No matter what the second stage tried to do at this point, it would never be able to reach orbit, and was thus a failure. Everyone in the room began to scream, questioning what had happened. I threw Alvarez under the bus, saying that she must have given me the wrong altitude. She looked confused and upset that I would betray her like that. Why was I doing this? What was wrong with me? Could it really be the stress? Captain Hayek didn't say anything or call me out, but somehow I think she was well aware of what I had done. 
I radioed back to Breaker 11, letting him know that the shot was a failure, and ordered him to turn round in order to reach 32,000 feet again. He affirmed and proceeded, but before I could relay the targeting information to the pilot like before, Captain Hayek spoke up. I think Specialist Alvarez should take this, Sergeant. Give her your headset. I... I didn't know what to say. The officer narrowed her eyes. I said, Specialist Alvare should take this one. Sergeant, I don't want anyone interfering with our little game. She said it softly but forcefully, as though I were her errant child. I didn't say anything back and handed Alvarez my headset. The specialist took the reins, guiding the flight lead as I'd done before. Breaker 11, that should be it. You're cleared to fire as soon as you hit Angels 32. And, as before, the pilot called in his shot as he reached the requested height. Breaker 11, Fox 5. We could hear through the speakers in our control room. I checked the time again. It was 1929 hours. Good, I thought to myself, though I still couldn't figure out why. The missile detached its first stage at the correct altitude this time. As it was designed to do, the second stage ignited and boosted the weapon into the necessary velocity for the rotors to take over. The tip jets guided the killer umbrella towards our anomalous hostage taker. We watched on the big screen as it tracked the kill vehicle's jaunt to the object's position near New America. I fixated my eyes on the feed we were still receiving from the surveillance satellite that had it in view. Just what was it? I looked back at the time on my desktop. 1935 hours. I felt relieved somehow, but again, I didn't know why exactly. Just as I took a sigh of relief, Alvarez spoke up. The rod! It got rid of it! She screamed. Indeed, the monster loosened whatever invisible grip it had on the piece of tungsten, and it floated away back towards New America. It wasn't threatening us anymore, thank God, but we were still threatening it. We're not going to give up this kill. That thing tried to fire at us. Continue with the trajectory, specialist, the commander ordered. Yes, sir, Alvarez responded. Second stage kill vehicle is within range, icing tip jets. I'm going to go for a direct strike with this one. Three, two, one, out. Tip jets deactivated. We're still on the money. One more minute to kill. Alvarez had obviously paid attention this morning in counter space academics. I was proud of her, as was everyone else in the room. Captain Hayek beamed at her while giving me the cold shoulder. The cold shoulder, I suppose, I deserved. But then, everyone's joy at Alvarez's accomplishment quickly dissipated with what we saw happen on screen. The object was back behind one of the hollowed-out asteroids of New America. It just suddenly wasn't where it had been. The remaining Shenglong, however, not so much. The missile was less than 15 seconds out now. The commander interjected. Fire the tip jets. Reorient. Move it out of the fucking way. Alvarez panicked, cracking her voice. I, I can't, sir. It's not accepting the signal. I, I can't move it. It's going to hit. She was beginning to tear up. The missile impacted the underside of the Shenlong with its rotors, veering off from it and being forced by its kinetic energy into the side of one of New America's asteroid habitats, shattering the weapon to pieces and obliterating several facilities constructed along the front end of the settlement. Everyone stood up from our chairs, a few wincing and others letting out desperate screams as the impact happened before their very eyes. It was over. We had failed. Whatever that thing was had bested us. I tried to console Alvarez, but she didn't trust me anymore and rejected any effort I made to let her know it wasn't her fault. I looked over at Captain Hayek. She just stared at me, not saying anything, 
and walked away. The NCOIC grabbed me by the shoulder as I sat back down and informed me that my actions from today would likely be investigated by a third party and that I should probably start getting in contact with Jack. Not only had I sacrificed the trust my apprentice had in me, but it seems as though I sacrificed my entire career for this thing. How am I going to be able to take care of Jerry now? I thought to myself. That's when I remembered. I left him in the truck outside. I got outside to check on him. It was just after dusk now. He was gone, with his broken skateboard and my wallet. Jerry, I'm sorry, I said to myself out loud, and hung my head over the open window on the passenger side. I'm so sorry. I heard some footsteps from behind and turned around. It was Captain Hayek and Color Sergeant Hayek Song, exiting the building and walking towards their car. As I watched them pull out of their parking space, someone tapped me on the shoulder from behind. I turned and saw three men in plain clothes, one of them sporting an Air Force Office of Special Investigations badge. Hi there, Sergeant. I'm Agent Williamson. These two men are with the National Scientific Intelligence Administration. They have a few questions about today's events, as do I, the agent explained. Before I could respond, the one with balding grey hair and wearing a white dress shirt pointed at Captain Hayek's car as it turned down the street and drove away. He said, Oh, and if you could, I'd like to know exactly everything you saw those two do the entire time they were here. Especially those two. So, there's part two done and dusted, another interesting episode in this saga, and it sounds like there's a lot, lot more to come, doesn't it? Well, yes, hope there will be. Hasn't been written yet, but I'm hoping for more myself, and I think you all are too. Well, there's been a few uh, new designs, new t-shirt designs over on Teespring. Thank you to all of those who've shown interest, and of course a very, very big thanks to all those of you who've bought the new designs. Um, If you haven't seen them, go and take a look. Um, I keep the price as low as possible, taking very little money for myself on those. I just want to give you a nice range of designs. Well, enough for me for one evening. I, of course, will be back once again on Friday. Hope you're going to join me. You are, aren't you? So you will. Go on. There you go. Okay, well, until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>